All right, today we're going to see what CNBC has to say about the shortage of auto mechanics. Why the U.S. has a shortage of auto mechanics. Auto technicians are back. Well, first off, this isn't 1980. Why are you using air tools? Give you guys some electric tools. And what is this? Why does it say titanium on the side? I don't know who makes this tool, but this is jumping out at me right away. Why do we have a... Uh, why do we have titanium? Like, why is that made of titanium? Is that made of titanium? Mm, suspect. Badly needed and in very short supply. The service staffing situation, that one's really been very, very challenging. Data from industry analysts J.D. Power indicate customers are waiting at least an extra day, sometimes much more, to get their cars serviced. This is happening at a time when the average age of U.S. vehicles keeps hitting record highs. Buying another car is out of the question for many. Prices for new and used vehicles hover near record highs. The shortage also spells challenges for dealers. Kevin Massey owns a Ford dealership in Napa, California, and despite in-house training and competitive salaries, he has been struggling to find service workers. Competitive salaries, you say? How competitive? How competitive? Service workers. Service revenue has dropped because I don't have enough people to service the clients. We have the demand, but we don't have enough supply of service staff to be able to do it, whether it be technicians or service advisor. Hold on, hold on. What did he say? We have the, we have the supply of work, but revenue has dropped because we don't have enough workers. About half of a dealership's profits come from parts and service. Every dealership that I know of has similar challenges that we have. There's just not enough technicians. It is not just dealers. Research indicates independent aftermarket repair shops around the country face the same scarcity. The pandemic has exacerbated the problem, but the shortage of technicians has been long term. Those in the business worry it is because of some kind of deep generational shift away from work in the trades. We've been on several calls with, you know, whether it's manufacturers and dealers combined, and it isn't that there's a ready solution immediately. A deep generational, a deep generational shift away from work in the trades. I don't think that's true. Everybody I know works in the trades. Everybody I know they're all electricians. <laughs> They're all electricians. They all work on a commercial, commercial building. Like com they, they all work commercial construction or residential construction, even if it's like plumbing, electrical, things like that. So I don't think that's true at all. A generational shift. If anything, I would say it's a generational shift towards the trades. Less people are going to college now. Uh, like when I was a kid, People would have said, oh, you have to go to college to get a good job. Now, everybody I know is saying, you got to get a trade to get a good job. You got to be a plumber or an electrician. On the horizon, right? Just because it's been ongoing for a while. The automotive industry is undergoing some of its biggest changes in history. For more than 100 years, the vast majority of cars have run on gasoline. Now, EVs are slowly but surely gaining ground. Let's check this out. What, how many cars are electrical on? How many vehicles are EV versus gasoline? The first result says the EV market share for new vehicle sales in February 24 is 6.5% compared to 83% for gas-powered vehicles. Okay, that's just for February 24. Still 6.5%, that's, that's a lot, but... What about, okay, so a different, a different article from Edmonds is saying that 1%, it's, so we got 99% gas-powered vehicles and diesel-powered vehicles versus 1% electrical vehicles. This is a little disingenuous to say slowly but surely gaining ground. When you've got, it's like a, it's a push by the manufacturers though. Is this really something that people want? Do people really want electrical vehicles? I mean, slowly but surely, hella slow, like super duper slowly. That's how I would describe this, uh, this push towards EV. And hold on, let's just stop and talk about electrical vehicles for a while. I drive 
1994 Corolla. What are the odds that somebody in a, I mean, that's a 31 year old vehicle now. What are the odds that somebody 30 years from now is gonna be driving their 2024 Tesla? I'm gonna say right next to zero. I'm gonna say there's not gonna be any 2024 Teslas driving around 30 years from now. I don't think so. Catch me in 30 years, we'll, we'll do an update on this. Servicing them requires a whole different set of skills. It also brings with it a lot of uncertainty for dealers and for technicians and would-be technicians plotting out careers. But there are also lots of opportunities. The cutting edge cars of today are built ever more around computers and software. If you like working with your hands, you like working with computers, and you like to make things that are broken be fixed, this is the industry. If you like working with your hands, you like working with computers. What? This is, this? <laughs> what? No, no, no. The computer nerd and the guy that likes working with his hands are two distinct personalities. This is a guy who doesn't like working with computers or working with his hands. That's what it sounds like. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The guy that likes working with his hands, the, I can see that overlapping with the guy who likes to make broken things be fixed, which is a weird way of wording it, but okay. But what are, what are you talking about, bro? Bro, what is you talking about? This doesn't make any sense. Dealers, automakers, and others in the industry are trying to learn more about the shortage and how it can be solved. Pay more. It's that simple, pay more. Pay for people's education. There has been a serious shortage of workers in an array of service positions during the pandemic. What the pandemic problem? When was this video made? This is from 2000, July 2022. So this is a two year old video basically. It was March of 2020 when we had the government response to the pandemic. This is like two years post COVID. Why are they? The great resignation, uh, as everyone's calling it. Um, dealerships are experiencing that too. Customers are waiting longer for service appointments. It typically takes customers around three and a half days to get a service appointment. But this year in our annual customer service index study, we were seeing that that increased by about a day. So it's now close to five days to get a service appointment. And depending on some brands, 20% of customers were taking over a week to get a service appointment. We've dramatically slowed down, not because of desire or want that. We want that, we want it to be quick. We just can't do it. We sometimes have the shortage of the staff. We sometimes have the shortage of the part. And, and like every store, we, we're trying like mad to get it done quickly. We want you to have a good experience. On top of the worker shortage, the supply chain turmoil continues. There's fewer loaner vehicles in stock part shortages on top of that, but certainly personnel is. Did he just say fewer loaner vehicles in stock? You're a dealership. You're a dealership. Loaner vehicles are not something that should be a problem. All right, part shortages. Man, I just don't experience this. I have not had any experience with part shortages. I've always, I can always get the parts. And I work on, the newest vehicles that I work on are 2022. My, I, I work on 2022 Mercedes Sprinters. If anything, if any vehicle is gonna have a, a problem getting parts, you would think that a Mercedes Sprinter would be been uh, one of the factors in that, that longer time to get a service appointment. Worker turnover is also pretty high. The highest turnover rate is among service advisors. They are the people who interact with customers, schedule and... So a service advisor is basically a sales job. That doesn't really... A high turnover rate with them, that doesn't mean anything. Sales guys are tramps. And you got to figure there's a lot of guys that don't... They don't really know what they're getting into when they become a service advisor. If they're hiring like dudes with no experience, it wouldn't surprise me that it's a high, a high turnover. Sell service work and communicate what needs to be done to the technician. We see that it's close to 50% turnover in a year at this point, which is shockingly high. 
that makes it really hard to build customer relationships when that's the case. Positions that we've had trouble with is service advisor. It is one of the most challenging positions to fill because it requires an ability to listen to customers, understand the workings of a vehicle, and communicate with technicians. You say the car is making this noise, and they have to communicate to the technician, cars making this noise at this time, this is what it does, this is what it sounds like, this is what it feels like, and be able to communicate to that technician who's gonna work on your car and give you back your, your vehicle repaired the first time so that you don't have to come back because that really creates dissatisfaction. That number is astronomical. Bro, tighten, button that top button. I don't like this. I don't like when people do this. Button that top button. That's some, that is an arrogant way to wear your shirt. I don't like this guy. I don't think I like this guy. Well, for dissatisfaction when you don't fix it right the first time. Massey also said he needs at least some staff who can speak and understand both Spanish and English. So you gotta be a mechanic and you have to be bilingual. What are you paying these guys? What, what are you paying these guys? I wonder, is there, is there a bump in pay for being bilingual? Is there a bump in pay for being bilingual? But long before COVID, there had been an ongoing technician shortage. The National Automobile Dealer Association estimates the industry is short about 37,000 trained techs each year. That technician shortage has been ongoing and is fairly pervasive. So it doesn't have anything to do with COVID because it, they just said long before COVID. It is notoriously tough to recruit people into the job of technician. It is also tough for employers to retain them. Of course, the first thing that comes to mind for anyone out. thinking about this and for the techs themselves when you ask them is money. <laughs> the overall compensation level is low given their skill and there's not a large range in pay or as much growth there. The average pay for an auto mechanic in 2021 was $47,990. People in the bottom 10th percentile made $29,010 and people in the top 90th percentile earned $75,100. But you can earn more. The tools alone, the tools alone that you're expected just to, just to get started. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about an impact wrench, sockets, and a ratchet. You're like $1,000 in once you get your impact wrench your sockets and your and your ratchet. Never mind if you're buying from from Snap-on, dude, you're paying well over $1000 for these sorts of tools and this is just to get started. So you're telling me I'm supposed to pay $1000 to get my foot in the door and you're going to and you're going to start me out at less than 30k per year? 75k is the top the top 10th percent the top 10% of guys the 90th percentile percentile I don't know how to say that that's not that much money 75k that's not that much money if you've been doing this for for 15 20 years and you're only making 75k this is highly skilled work this is highly skilled work so it just doesn't it just doesn't check out a technician that's a high performer in this business can make 80 to 100 thousand dollars and that's pretty darn good money. That's pretty darn good money in Napa, California. Is it, is it really good money in Napa, California? What a joke. This dude's out of touch. What do you think he's making? What do you think his GM is making? What do you think his service advisor is making? Or his service manager is making? They ain't making no 80000 per year. And dude, there's way more, you know, you can comment down below and let me know what you think, but I'm gonna say there's way more skill involved in being your basic lube tech, your basic service tech, than there is being a GM or being a service manager. And those guys are making way more money. One of the challenges with technicians is in a lot of cases are the personnel is paid based on the work itself, right? It's a flat rate type work that's paid for based on the job allocated to it. So at times may not be as stable if there's not as much work coming in. Flat rate work also incentivizes technicians to work quickly or efficiently, but it might not account for the amount of time they spend doing other tasks such as quickly or efficiently. I think a better way to describe what flat rate work is encouraging 
It's encouraging technicians to cut corners. Is diagnosing problems. The job often comes without benefits or other perks as well. And we often find that techs, when we survey them, have very little common benefits that are offered. Um, you know, even like individual health insurance, not all technicians are offered that. Um, 401ks, even fewer are offered. Especially someone who maybe is young and then has a family, if they're not getting what they need benefits-wise at work after a few years, they're probably gonna look elsewhere. But techs also don't seem to feel confident they can make a lifelong career out and this is a hazardous job. You're dealing with, you're dealing with uh, chemicals that are gonna affect your long-term health. Are they giving you proper PPE? No, probably not. Like masks and, and uh, I'm assuming they're giving you gloves. I don't know, if you're working in a dealership, are they giving you good gloves? To not have, to work at a dealership and not get health insurance as a tech, that shit's wild, guys. I feel bad. I feel bad for you guys. Of their job. There's a real lack of career progression or understanding what the career path is. Our industry traditionally didn't have career path. We're trying to create a career path so it's more professional. The day-to-day -day job of a tech can be exhausting. And the I feel like a 401k is a good way to lock somebody in long-term. So if you're not offering a 401k, why is somebody gonna stay with you for 20 years working for you? culture of shops and dealerships can seem harsh. Techs, you know, tend to work pretty long hours and often have odd schedules. You know, if someone's got to work the late shift or on the weekend, they may work six days straight. And, you know, it's manual labor. It can definitely be grueling. And a lot of techs tell us when we survey them and interview them that they don't feel that they're appreciated, that they don't feel that, you know, there's a real work-life balance or any sort of social component. The auto technician trade may be suffering some of these same reputational challenges seen with other trades. How much money are we looking at in this guy's toolbox right now? If he's got snap-on tools, we're probably looking at like, dude, we're looking at like $1,000 in sockets or something. Those screwdrivers and pry bars, this toolbox itself. At the end of the day, when we're looking at the younger set of people, they're not going into the trades or what we would call a trade. What did he just say? This guy's so out of touch. This guy's really out of touch. Why does he think that younger people aren't going into the trades? So it's, he's basically just shifting the blame. That's too bad, man. You would think as an employer that like you own a dealership. You have all the power, all the power is within, <laughs> everything is within your power to take responsibility for this situation and solve these problems. It, it really does, I mean, he's just shifting the blame onto the younger generation. Disappointing. If they're not going into the trades, what are they doing? What are they doing? The big piece of this is that the career of a technician we've found has become less and less desirable over the years. You know, it used to be that many people would grow up, you know, working on cars with their dads, had interest in it. It was a respected career field. Kids would be, you know, potentially geared towards that field in high school and maybe even earlier. And now more and more we see that there's not that same trend and that most high schools really push, you know, everyone should go to a four year university and there's a much smaller is that what high schools are still pushing? Are they still telling you that you need to go to university? Dude, who goes to high school? All our pipeline uh, of people coming into the technician field. The schools also that provide that service and education, they've really reduced. So someone that says, hey, look, I wanna have auto shop class, a lot of the schools don't have it anymore. The technician pay is very good, but there's no place for them to get trained. The technician doesn't, being a technician doesn't pay very good. So it's the younger gen, according to this guy in Napa, 80K is a good salary in Napa, California. It's the fault of the younger generation and the fault of the schools. Dude, I'm 30 years old. Is he talking about me? Am I the younger generation? So what are the solutions? How do dealers or shops struggling to find or retain talent turn things around? 
increase the pay, add benefits, increase the respect. Dude, the, the mechanic in a dealership scenario is the least respected person out of everybody. Want to recruit uh, younger folks today. A lot of them are gonna want a more stable and known pay structure. One idea to handle the pay problem is to provide some kind of minimum guaranteed pay. For new technicians who may not get many jobs at first or may be spending a lot of their time on the diagnostic work or on their training, knowing that... Or on their tools. That's a crazy thing. I can't believe we're nine minutes into this 13 minute video and nobody has mentioned... I mean, look at these tools. Look, that, that fucking toolbox over there, that black one, is probably $20,000 by itself. It's like 15 or $20,000. You start adding in all the tools inside of it, dude, in this picture, in this picture, we're probably looking at like 50 to $100,000 in tools. And that's bought by the tech. They're gonna make at least X is something that can be very important for them in those first few years. If they aren't able to make what they need to make to, you know, pay back their education costs and pay for their tooling. Okay. I think that this is the first, that's the first time anybody's mentioned paying for their tooling. That they need to become a technician. It's really hard for them to keep going in the career. Massey has instituted pay and retention bonuses for technicians. That helps to a point. There's always someone that can pay more than we can pay, but can they provide you the environment? We can, and that's where we want to win. And so I work very hard. No, there's not always someone who can pay more than you can pay. Can they provide the environment? What is he gonna say about his environment right now? <laughs> hey, de hey, dealer techs, tell me what the environment is. Tell me what the environment is in your dealership, in your shop hard to make sure our work environment is better than anybody else's. We provide benefits. You have 401k, we have medical. So yes, we have all of those things. We want you to be healthy. We want you to have fun and we want you to be able to make a good living. He also recruits. We as Ford dealers go out and go to the schools and try to attract those youngsters and say, hey, come to work for us. We provide a great environment. For some roles, he casts a wide net. We also, as a store, look at it a little different. I look for people in other trades or other industries. You could be a waiter, you could be anything. If I know that you have work ethic and will come to work, then I wanna to talk to you. He takes seriously the need to provide a career path. We're trying to create a career path so it's more professional. You can map out your career path, you can map out what your pay plan is gonna be moving forward. He has an in-house training program. We have what's called Quick Lane to get you, which is basically maintenance and light repair. Quick Lane is not in-house training. That's, you're doing oil changes. You're not getting trained on shit. You're not getting trained on anything. And nobody's being paid to train you. Like, why would they train you if they're not getting paid to? to get you started there and get you trained and we'll get you trained up to move from quick lane into used cars, from used cars into your specialty within Ford or Lincoln. Large dealership groups or service chains may have the size and scale to develop their own recruitment and training resources. Independent shop owners like Massey may not have the resources to take on recruiting or retention challenges as much as they would like. We would like to see, you know, ways for the OEs to help even small dealers who don't maybe have the same resources as those large dealer groups be able to take some of those ideas and some of those practices and implement it on a smaller scale so that this problem can be addressed overall and not just for those larger dealer groups. Ford recognizes that if we don't have technicians, we can't service the vehicles. Therefore, the brand image and the brand expectation drops. They've done things, they provided scholarships, they're doing things within the school to attract more into the trades. These severe shortages have turned staff recruiting into a seller's market. Candidates for jobs are able to aggressively negotiate pay and benefits. In the case of service advisors, they can hop from one job to a better paying one. Some of the seniors are coming out with a signing bonus like they're an NFL player. We're seeing that. <laughs> Bro, just his attitude right there. Just his attitude right there. That tells you everything, he, everything you need to know about 
the way he feels about his employees. Now, he was talking about service advisors right there. But I'm not... I don't think it's really easy being a service advisor either, either, especially if you've never been a mechanic because these guys are sales guys. They're just trying to, they're trying to help people understand and feel comfortable giving the dealership money and why they're giving the dealership money. That's not an easy job. That takes skill, that takes skill also. And I can understand why you don't have mechanics. I can understand why you have this insulation between the customer and the mechanic because a lot of time, a lot of times the people that are working on your cars, they don't have very good communication skills and they might not be the best person to explain why you need to fork over two, three, four thousand dollars to fix your car. So I, I can see the use for a service advisor. NFL player, we're seeing that. But industry insiders say now is an exceptionally interesting time to be in auto service. With increasing electrification of vehicles too, there's so much more going on in this space than there used to be for a long. This is a non, this is not even a point that should be talked about. An elect, electrical, ve electric vehicles are such a small part of the overall vehicle landscape. It doesn't even bear talking about. The, the electrical, the, the electrification of vehicles, more like the electronification, where you have supercomputers in your car to drive down the road. You don't need a supercomputer to drive down the road. You really don't. But that's, that's the direction everything's going. So the skill, the skill required to work on these vehicles is going up every year. The pay is not coming up to match. The training is not coming up to match. The respect, it's not coming up to match. Long time, vehicles didn't change much, right? Now with the rise of EVs and hybrids, there's a lot more going on and a lot more things that technicians can do and learn and be trained on. And it's really a whole different career A whole now. different career, exactly. That does bring uncertainty with it. One of the frequently touted benefits of EVs is that they don't require as much maintenance as internal combustion vehicles. There are no oil changes, for example. With an internal combustion engine, you got greasy. And there was a lot of oil and a lot of grease, and that's what made an internal combustion engine go. Well, we're seeing that dramatically decrease with the BEV, so the amount of oil and things is gone because you don't have any oil in the car. So we, we're, we're seeing that change. The dealers are certainly having to account for the fact that their service departments are probably going to look different. I don't know about five years from now, but 10, ten years from now, let's say 30% of the vehicle. Try like 50 years from now. I'm guessing 50 years from now, people will have gotten their head out of their ass and realized that electrical vehicles are not the answer. That's my guess. People sold or EVs, they'll require less work or different types of work. Reshaping the perception of the That's auto technician fantasy. could be as simple as highlighting the tremendous technological changes underway. An auto mechanic really is an auto technician that is an auto computer person. That's the way this industry is going. That is so eloquent. Such an eloquent boy. Well, I'm gonna say that overall that was a miss. They kind of they kind of missed the point. Did they talk to a mechanic this entire this entire video? Did we see anybody who was a mechanic? why the u.s has a shortage of auto mechanics and they didn't talk to one single tech it's not that complicated there's no paid training there's not enough money there's not enough benefits it's not that complicated anyways just wanted to show that to you guys uh go ahead and leave a comment down below and tell me what you think if you're a mechanic like and subscribe if you haven't already keep an eye up the hill guys